A few years ago, uh, I was uh, watching Oprah Winfrey. Uh, I can't remember why, but there's a really good reason why I was watching TV in the afternoon. I remember on one interview, she was interviewing Arnold Schwarzenegger, and uh, I guess it was a happier time for him then. Had his lovely wife, uh, Maria, there. And Oprah was saying how rich and famous he was and how much money he had and so on. And I remember the big guy looking at her and saying, Oprah, I have to tell you, I have found money doesn't bring happiness. I now have $50 million and I am no happier than when I had $48 million. <laughs> and the audience laughed and I thought, yep, the big guy's nailed it. What he's doing is actually mocking us. And that is, we say money doesn't buy happiness, but no one really believes that. In fact, like, why don't you try it with me now? Um, I'm going to say, like, say it with me, money doesn't buy happiness. And we'll see how you go. Yeah, say it with me, ready? Money doesn't buy happiness. Well done. Uh, but you know what, as I say that, in the back of my mind's a little voice saying, yeah, but I'd love a truckload to find out for myself. <laughs> and that's the way it is really, isn't it? Money is exciting, money's seductive. That's why BRW, the Business Review Weekly, publish each year the Rich 200 list. Uh, the 200 richest people in Australia. Uh, this year, or 2012 edition I've got here, uh, Gina Reinhart, the, uh, the richest woman, on $29 billion. $29 billion, and you drop down to the 200th person who has a meagre $210 million. Now, you notice they print the uh, rich 200 list, they don't print the poor 2 million list. Right? Why, money's exciting. Now, how cool would it be to, to be rich? And so what do people do? Well, some set out to work really hard and work 60, 70 hours a week to kind of climb the greasy pole and uh, become wealthy. And others dream of winning it. So a few months ago, the lotto draw was worth $20 million. And you know, on that particular day, I checked on the net, there were seven and a half million tickets sold. Seven and a half million tickets. And you know, I remember uh, when there was a big lotto draw in a news agency there, I, I walked in and I just wanted to buy a card for somebody. And I couldn't work out why the queue went from the cash register across the whole news agency and out onto the footpath. And then I found out it was one of these massive 20 million or more draws. And you know, I, I figured if you asked every one of those people, those 30 or 40 people who were lined up, what would you do if you won lotto? What would you do with the money? They would have worked out their list of what it is that they do. Gordon Gecko says, money never sleeps. That was his thing in the, in the sequel uh, of uh, Wall Street. Money never sleeps. And how would it be to be rich? Now what about, have you ever thought globally, in terms of planet Earth, why is it that some parts of the world are really rich, like Australia? Why is it that some parts of the world are really rich and other parts of the world actually struggle, uh, are poor. It's actually quite a complicated, there's no one simple, easy explanation. Some parts are rich, some parts are poor. Now, I've done a little bit of reading about it. Let me show you two or three books that have interesting kind of perspectives on why it is that some parts of the world are rich and others poor. David Landers, The Wealth and Poverty of Nations, uh, look, in the, the title self-explanatory, he's got a really good introduction about the effect of geography and climate on the ability to produce wealth. And one thing I learned from him, that is, um, the ability to produce agricultural wealth, to grow food and, and agriculture and so on, is much more difficult in the tropics. It's kind of counterintuitive. But he's saying to, to live in a temperate region where there's actually a winter and rainfall and so on is much more regular, uh, means you can grow uh, agriculture and so on and food much, much more easily than around the equator through the tropics. And interestingly, he says, um, one, the part of the world that has the most perfect climate in terms of the production of wealth and food and so on is Western Europe. And that was a major factor, or one of the factors in Western Europe actually growing stronger and stronger. Now there's another book that's uh, maybe not as scholarly but more entertaining, P.J. O'Rourke, uh, Eat the Rich. He's an American journalist and uh, right-wing commentator. Uh, if you haven't read this, uh, you may not agree with his politics, but you'll laugh a lot as you read it. Listen to what he says about it. As he, he sets out uh, the question he sets out to answer. Uh, Rourke says this, I had one fundamental question about economics. Why do some places prosper and thrive while others just suck? It's not a matter of brains. No part of the earth is dumber than Beverly Hills and the residents are wading in gravy. 
In Russia, meanwhile, where chess is a spectator sport, they're boiling stones for soup. Nor can education be the reason, nor natural resources be the answer. Africa has diamonds, gold and uranium, you name it. Scandinavia has little and it's frozen besides. And so he travels the world, looks at uh, good capitalism and bad capitalism, good socialism, bad socialism, and he gets to the end, just very quickly to say, he says, we know what to do and we know how to do it. So what's wrong with the world? To a certain extent, it's the same thing that's wrong with me because the prosaic, depressing and somewhat shameful fact is that the secret to getting ahead is just what my parents told me. And then he has a boring list that every parent tells every child. Hard work, education, responsibility, property rights, the rule of law, democratic government. Interesting book. Doesn't quite dig down enough, but entertaining, insightful. Now, what O'Rourke says is this. Um, there's been a huge explosion of wealth um, on planet Earth in the last couple of hundred years. Now, I don't know how he, he, he's found somebody with a propeller hat to work this out, but in the 300 years from 1500 to 1800, okay, you've got 1500 to 1800, GDP per person around the planet grew at 27 cents a year. It was almost dead flat, 27 cents. And then from 1800 for the next 200 years, it grew at 100 times faster, $27 per person. Now, what happened? Well, the answer, obviously, uh, the Industrial Revolution. And so uh, with that, wealth and so on around the planet has just skyrocketed. And of course, Western Europe led the way. Now, why? It's not just that the climate was good there. And what O'Rourke doesn't, PJ O'Rourke doesn't go quite far enough. He doesn't look at, at, at the foundational things. Here's the third book, and very interesting, a book by um, Rodney Stark, American professor at Baylor University in Texas, The Victory of Reason. Now, what Rodney Stark argues, and I'm not, I'm not sure if Professor Stark's a Christian or not, it, you can't tell from the way he writes. What he argues is this, that it was the Christian worldview or Christian theology that the Western world put into practice, particularly Europe put into practice, that made this massive growth in wealth possible. Uh, and there's just little things that, if you live in Australia, that we take for granted, but are, are key things that come out of a Christian worldview or Christian theology, like the rule of law, that those who make the laws are under the laws themselves. Um, guaranteed property rights that flow out of that, that mean people will invest for the future. Um, his argument in this book is that, that that led to capitalism, democracy, and the creation of wealth. I mean, he'll also argue that the Christian worldview led to the creation of modern science as well, but that's, that's for another session. So, isn't it interesting? His argument, um, and you may not agree, but I think it's very persuasive, his argument is it's the Christian worldview applied led to the creation of wealth and this massive jump. The Bible says that as well. The Bible says that the ability to create wealth is the gift of God. God is the one who gives wealth and gives that ability. So uh, 1300 BC, as Moses is about to bring uh, the people of Israel into the promised land, the land of Canaan, God says to them, don't forget something. Right? Now you're poor and you're just living in the desert. You'll come into a land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of prosperity. But look what God warns them about. In Deuteronomy, just before they come into the promised land, God says this to them. You may say to yourself, this is when they're in the land and wealthy and prosperous. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so uh, for each nation, God gives some the ability to produce wealth. Uh, for individuals. Now, um, if, if you're wealthy... And if you uh, live in Australia and you have access to a uh, video recorder and television to be watching this, you're one of the wealthy ones in the world. And where does that come from? Well, it comes from the fact that God's given you certain abilities or gifts, uh, certain opportunities, certain family background, education, maybe even down to the, the country that you were born in. The ability to produce wealth is the gift of God. Now, of course, the problem is that around the world we... There just isn't quite enough to go around at the moment. We just, we, we need more. 
Uh, so some, some countries are right on the verge of bankruptcy. I mean, even in Australia, there's just not quite enough, is there? So even with the mining boom uh, uh, you know, and all the wealth that that's generated, we're still struggling. The hospital system is always kind of just on borderline of coping and, uh, and so on. Uh, there's still people who are homeless in our capital cities. There's people living in poverty. People worry about people on pensions and so on, worry about electricity prices and, and so on. Um, there's an obvious need for a national disability insurance scheme. And, and there obviously needs to be, and both sides of politics realise that, they're just trying to work out how do we pay for it. And as individuals, you know, the, if you watch the interest rates because, you know, the mortgage can kind of, you know, get, get too deep. Uh, you can be on the edge financially if you've got kids at school, uh, school fees, petrol, food, transport. It, I don't know what kind of a budgeter you are. I'd be the world's worst budgeter. My wife Kathy's uh, trying to get me onto a, a particular app called uh, Track My Spend. And so now I've had to sign up to, um, she gives me an allowance for the month and I have to put down every dollar I spend on this app and then at the end it, like, it goes red as soon as you cross the line. I know, it goes red. And so I end up just saying to her all the time, how come there's so much month left at the end of the money? But uh, anyway. Now, here's a question for you then. If you're, you know, as a nation, we're doing it a bit tough, maybe as an individual, how much would be enough? What if we could get, what if we had, say, three times the income that we have now? That, that would have to be enough, wouldn't it? Three times? Or, or let's just be completely over the top. What about seven times. That, that would have to be enough. Uh, do you know that we are now, as a nation, three times wealthier than we were in the 1950s? I don't mean through inflation, I mean in real terms we have three times the income um, that we had in the 1950s. I'll mention it again later in another one of these Money Talk sessions. In fact, if you go back a hundred years, we are seven times wealthier than we were. In real terms, seven times wealthier. There's just little kind of cameos that you can see that show that. Here's, a, <laughs> here's an interesting piece of trivia. Um, uh, in 1900, I've worked out basically it's the same in Australia, but let me give you an American example. In 1900, the average American worker had to work for three hours to buy a chicken to eat. Three hours work to buy a chicken. Now, in the USA, and it's the same here, the average worker has to work for... 30 minutes or less to buy a chicken, okay? What's that mean? Well, the price of food, if you like chicken, and right, the price of food is now one-sixth of what it was. So how can it be that we don't have enough? We're three times wealthier than 1950, seven times wealthier than the early 1900s. How can it be that it's not enough? Well, it's a problem in the 21st century and it was a problem in the first century and it was the same problem and Jesus diagnosed it. Now, let me show you. Um, in these sessions, the Money Talk sessions, we're going to look at Jesus' interaction with four rich men in Luke's Gospel. All right, and we'll, we'll work out. They're all covered in chapters 9 through to 19 of Luke, and you may like to read that independently. But let's have a look at this first rich man that Jesus interacts with, and you find it in Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So here's a, an argument about an inheritance and brothers fighting over things. And, I mean, you can have some sympathy for him, can't you? I guess it happens so often. You've heard the old expression, where there's a will, there's a relative. Yeah, so, uh, all right, same in the first century. Look at Jesus' reply. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? I think what Jesus is saying is, I didn't come to referee your cat fights. Um, but he does diagnose the problem. And then the next word to the crowd, then he said to them, to the crowd that's following him, then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Let me read that one again, it's worth trying to digest it. Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus says, watch out, what's the problem? <laughs> the problem is greed. And he gives a definition, you see at the end of the verse, what's, uh, what's the definition of greed? It's believing that life consists in the abundance of our possessions. Life is about how much stuff I have. 
And why does he say, watch out? And the answer is this. Greed is seductive. Greed will sneak up on you. Greed is our great blind spot. No, <laughs> nobody thinks they're greedy. Really, we're not. I'm not. You're not. I just need the next thing. And I know when I get it, like when I get my iPhone 5, life will be complete. I've got a 4, it's just not quite... A, or whatever it is for you, the next thing will, will make life better. And what Jesus is saying is, if our life is defined by what we own, it will never be enough. It'll never be enough. Even if you triple or multiply by seven, the amount of money you have, it'll never be enough. Now, it's worth thinking about, about why that is, isn't it? Why is it that we can have all that extra money over these decades and it's not enough? Let me give you a couple of basic reasons and I'll over the next three sessions, I'll look at other reasons why. But here's a couple of kind of just common sense, everyday reasons. The first reason is this. Things become ordinary. Just ordinary. So you look forward to getting something. I don't know what it might be for you, whether it's you know clothes or a car or golf clubs or shoes or technology, you know, the right the phone or furniture or even a house. You look forward to it. And then then you get it and then after a little while it's it's ordinary. I remember looking forward to, I got a, I this beautiful new Holden Commodore, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a V8 but um, it's green because it drops back to four cylinders when you're just chugging along so, uh, okay. But I remember looking forward to that and thinking, wahoo, when it was going to be delivered and I got it and yeah, and then after a couple of days it was just, it was just baldy headed me driving around in a car again. Things become ordinary. And I'll tell you what else. Yesterday's luxuries become today's necessities, become invisible tomorrow. Yesterday's luxuries become today's necessities, become invisible tomorrow. So um, you take the automatic dishwasher. Right? Uh, I love to tell my kids, and they, you know, the kids just love, tell us stories about when you were a kid, Dad, please teach us from that. Yeah, right. But I, I tell them, you know, when I grew up, we had two dishwashers in our house. Really? Yes, it was me and my brother, and Dad said, go and do the dishes and that happened. Now every house has or pretty much every house has a mechanical dishwasher and guess what? It, it's invisible. Dishwasher isn't a luxury anymore, it's a necessity. Or um, uh, I can remember 1974, we got our first colour television. Whoa, that was a big deal. And it was just kind of the size of a dinner plate. And, then, and now we've got these, these huge plasma screens and uh, there's still nothing to watch. But even the giant screens now are, are ordinary. Or mobile phones. I remember I had a mate who was a doctor in the early 90s and um, he had a mobile phone and he, he gave it to me um, And when he got another one. And it was the size and weight of a paving brick. Remember? And it had buttons about the size of your thumb and so on and big long aerial and that. And I thought, wow. Now, I don't think anybody anymore, I can pull out the iPhone 4 and no one says, wow, because everyone has to have a phone. It's just... And that's what happens. You, our standard of living just gets higher and higher and higher and it becomes more and more ordinary. And the second reason is this. We assess our wealth by our peer group. Um, as your peer group gets richer and richer and richer, you don't feel any better off. You don't notice it. So everyone has iPhones, everyone has the house, everyone has the... Now, I've heard you know, economists say, yes, um, but a rising tide lifts all the boats. Yeah, but then everyone still feels like they're living at sea level, okay? You don't, you don't feel rich because everyone's the same. And what we do is we notice people who are a few rungs further up the ladder. And if someone really becomes wealthy, they move up the ladder and they move into a new peer group and then they feel ordinary with everybody else and, and so on. But deep down we end up thinking, if I just had more, I'd feel more important, I'd feel happier, I'd feel more secure. And life becomes defined by what we own. Now, Jesus is not against us owning possessions. You hear me say that? Jesus is not against us owning possessions. Jesus is against possessions owning us. Do you see the difference? Against possessions owning us. And so he tells us a, a story, a parable, to show how foolish it is to live life, uh, to think life is about the abundance of possessions. 
chapter 12, verse 16. So Jesus continues, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Then verse 16, and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. And so the the man's already rich. He's got all he needs. Um, God's been very generous to him. The good crop is is the gift of God. Uh, He hasn't done anything wrong. He's just got a mountain of grain and so wealth. Verse 17, he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. He's got more than enough. In fact, he's got so much, he hasn't got anywhere to put it. So what will he do? Then he said, verse 18, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink and be merry. I remember speaking on this part of the Bible a few years ago uh, in the Sydney CBD, in a City Bible Forum meeting. And uh, at the end of the talk, um, one of the guys at the back put his hand up and said, well, Al, what did, what did the guy do wrong? It's what every, every uh, financial investment advisor would say. You know, you've got a, a season where there's lots and lots of grain, so the price per kilo was dropped. Uh, if you can afford to, you put it away, you wait till there's a lower season and then the price goes up and then you sell at a better price. It's just economics. It's a good question, isn't it? So what has he done that's wrong? The answer is that his eyes are too close together. His eyes are too close. Let me show you. Let me read you his speech again and you'll see it's obvious. And you listen for the eyes being close together. You ready? And he thought to himself... What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and there I will store all my grain and my goods and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. You see the eyes, it's all about I, me. Now who's missing from that little speech? Do you notice? Well, let's have a look. Uh, That would be God is missing and everyone else on the planet as well. It's just all about him, isn't it? And you know what? There's no thankfulness and there's no generosity. There's no thankfulness and no generosity. And not only is it selfish, it's dumb. Because there's a major problem with this as an investment strategy. Why? Because the very next thing that Jesus says is this. As he's making all these plans to eat, drink and be merry for years and years to come. What is it? Verse 20. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. You fool, God says. Let me take you back to that, uh, the news agents and the lotto queue. So you've got people queuing up across the news agents and out onto the footpath as they wait for their $20 million lotto coupon. I know, if you walked up to people and said, uh, what is it that you would do if you won lotto? They'd have the list. I'll buy a car, house, stop work, whatever it is. So great. Okay. Um, wonder, could I ask you, what do you think happens when you die? And almost everyone says, oh, I, I don't know, I haven't thought about it much. Or I try not to think about it. And then I could say, well, look, I don't, I don't want to rain on the parade, but the chances of, of like winning lotto were like one in five million. Uh, but the mortality rate hovers around 100%. Do you think it might be worth thinking about that? Huh? In uh, the Business Review Weekly, I've noticed there's a section um, in previous BRW Rich 200s Um, They've stopped doing it in 2012. Let me tell you about it. So 2009, what they used to do, they'd list the 200 wealthiest people and then um, at the back, they'd list people who've dropped out of the 200. Um, And sometimes they dropped out of the 200 for um, uh, financial reasons. You know, the stock market had gone bad or whatever. But sometimes, sadly, they dropped out because they died. And... What was interesting in the front, the, the amounts varied from billionaires down to a miserable, you know, two, three hundred million, something like that. But um, so the, the amounts varied a lot in the 200s. But I found something strange. When, when you go and look in terms of the obituaries, 
and what people left behind. So there's one man here who's a transport magnate from South Australia, uh, another man who was a manufacturer from Brisbane, and, uh, sorry, from Melbourne and so on. Um, what I found out at the end, they, they listed how much they left behind. And I, it was surprising. The number was always the same. Everything. Everything they left behind. And that's what Jesus is saying. This man was a fool because <laughs> he'd lived his life accumulating more and more and now who will get what you prepared for yourself? See, what Jesus is saying is not only is wealth a gift from God, but our very life itself comes from God. And Jesus calls this man a fool because God will demand an accounting for what we have done with our lives. And isn't it foolish, this man spent his whole life ignoring his creator and accumulating more and more and more wealth, which ultimately won't finally satisfy, and he'll leave it all behind, and now he'll appear before God to give an accounting for what he's done with his life and his wealth. And if I could sharpen it up, if we spend our lives ignoring God and focusing on wanting more and more and more stuff, we are fools. To want to be rich, to have an abundance, yeah. But true riches, real treasure is actually found in knowing God. That's what Jesus will say. All right? God, the one who uh, gives us life itself. And what's Jesus saying here? He's talking about two ways to try and be rich. There's a foolish way and a wise way. All right? The foolish way they think that life is about accumulating more and more and more stuff and that'll be found to be empty. So we appear before God who want to know what we've done with our lives. The other way to be rich is actually knowing God. And we can know God through Jesus, find forgiveness and have relation with him and actually have a relationship that really is treasure. And you know what? Once you actually do come to know God and be rich with him, it puts money uh, and possessions in perspective. We actually know how to use them, how to enjoy them, how to be generous with them. Uh, in our next session, we're going to look at what it is that Jesus says about the next rich man in Luke's gospel and how money shows what we really believe and what we value. And the question will be, are you investing wisely?